I want to talk about a little bit about spinning wheels and, and what happens when we get caught in um, working really hard at something and feeling like we're not getting anywhere or when we get caught in the opposite, which is not being able to get something started. Um, these are a few things that are resources if you're interested in checking out. Uh, one of them is a book that I have coming out in a spring about psychological barriers to movement. And that's one of those things that people often struggle with. So I want to talk about five things that are barriers to us. And this is from a psychological end, but, al but also a, um, a contemplative practice lens. So the first barrier is that we think that we are normal. And when I go on retreat to uh, Plum Village, there's these incredible sunflower fields, fields all around Plum Village, which is a monastery uh, where Thich Nhat Hanh lived. And it is pretty phenomenal to run past or walk past, you know, sunflower field after sunflower field for miles. And one thing that you start to notice when you look at sunflowers is that none of them are normal. <laughs> Every single sunflower is distinct and different and not, not one fits the prototype of what is a sunflower. And we assume for ourselves as humans that there's some kind of normal. So there's like a normal way to, um, I don't know, write a book. There's a normal way to have a relationship. There's a normal way to be a parent. There's a normal way to live a life. But there is no real normal. And even though we can say, just like me, we're all the same, we're also all different, that it's a paradox that we can hold both. Uh, we can think of that in, in the way of there's a me and there's a you that are a we, but that also we're very different. And when you look at it from a psychology perspective, there's a good amount of research out now looking at what does it mean to be normal? Because much of psychology, at least the field that I'm from in clinical psychology, there was this big thing. I mean, we'd get our book in grad school, which said abnormal psychology. I don't know if anyone took a psych 101 class. It was actually called that abnormal psychology. But what they found is that actually there is no normal. When, when they look at like a personality profile, these things like the big five, um, personality, the ocean, if you've ever heard of that, like openness and conscious, conscientiousness and extroverted versus introverted. 90% of people fall outside of average on the trait, even if they're given a personality profile. The odds of you being normal are one in 16 million. I did this, I just mentioned, I came out of this big um, talk to three, 250 therapists and this is a picture of the room and this is an arrow pointing to the last time the last person you know that someone was was normal was right there in that room because none of us are normal and when you actually look at uh, these diagnoses the diagnostic categories that have been created and you trace the history of, of diagnosis and diagnostic categories in clinical psychology it is a dark history it actually those categories were very much based early on in eugenics, in trying to categorize people as normal versus abnormal to try and select only a few people to be the normal. When you do diagnoses of um, folks and you're, you're diagnosing with anxiety disorder or an eating disorder or major depressive disorder, most people actually fall in what's called not otherwise specified. They don't fit the category. So what does that mean if we're not normal? This is an image of me on an airplane. And this is how I sit on airplanes. <laughs> because for me, sitting in a normal position on an airplane hurts my body. 
So I sit in a very abnormal way. I sit on the floor for a very long flight. I'll squat on the floor, I'll stand for part of the flight, I'll walk the aisle with the two-year-olds, and I look really abnormal. But if you were to ask people on an airplane, how good do they feel in their body, right? They, most people would say it doesn't feel good to sit in that little space for very long. So one thing that holds us, keep, we keep on trying, you know, to, or we feel like we're spinning our wheels is we're trying to fit ourselves into some kind of category of normal, even though there is no normal. Are we following this? The ab, that, that we all are unique individuals and that if we're all following one path, it ends up harming us. Here's another abnormal thing. This is 6.45 in the morning on Friday mornings. Every Friday morning, the school that my kids go to go down to the ocean and um, the jump in the water. 6.45 in the morning, the kids, the teachers, the dogs, rain or shine or, or fog. We don't, it doesn't snow here in Santa Barbara, but everyone goes down to the water. We have silence. We read a poem and then we all jump in. That is not normal, right? So starting to, one of the things that prevents us from um, stepping out of our comfort zone is that we think that it's not normal. It's a deviant, whoops. But if you start to, to look at it in a different way and start to see that just like me, you're not normal, I'm not more normal, it gives us some freedom to maybe explore some other options. There's a, um, there's a metaphor that I often use in therapy when people feel like they are stuck. And the metaphor is of someone that's in a hole and that has a shovel and they're doing the normal thing that you do when you have a shovel and you're in a hole. What do you do if you, if you're, if you're, if you have a shovel in a hole, you dig, right? And so in doing the normal thing, you dig and you dig and you dig and you dig and you find yourself digging deeper and deeper. The abnormal thing would be to maybe put the shovel up in the air and see if someone would grab it and help pull you out or to throw the shovel away and do something else, you know, start climbing a wall or look for something different to help get you out. But when you find yourself, you know, working harder and harder and harder at the same thing, it's probably best to be abnormal and to not go the normal route. So the next four of the things that keep us stuck are going to be going against the grain. And a lot of Buddhism is actually not normal. I was just meeting with somebody today um, and I was explaining this concept of, of being with and embracing pain. And this is someone that was very new to this concept, even new to the concept of Buddhism. And they looked at me and said, why would you ever want to do that? <laughs> why would you ever want to embrace pain? That sounds horrible, right? It's, it's very much part of if you've been practicing for a, a, a long time. Yeah, of course, that's what we do. We embrace pain. We sit with suffering, <laughs> we, we breathe in the, the people that we don't like, we send them love, right? These are all abnormal behaviors. But when the norm is not well, then maybe we need to do something different. It's not that we're broken or we're sick, it's that we're stuck. So the second reason why we may be working really hard at something and we find that we're just like treading water and getting nowhere, is that we might be holding on too tight. And this comes from the you know, Buddhist principle of attachment, but there's also a lot of science now looking at attachment and non-attachment, looking at it from a scientific lens. My dad was uh, or is a Buddhist and he, I grew up with a lot of uh, parables and a lot of cones. And my very first one that I ever remember him teaching me was about the monkey with the hand in the jar with the banana. 
and uh, that, you know, the monkey's trying to pull the, the banana out of the jar, pull the banana out of the jar, and he can't get it out unless he lets go. But you could try this for yourself. I mean, you could pick up an object if you have a phone. Pick up a phone, grab a hold of it, or a pen, it doesn't really matter. And then pick up another object in the other hand. So you have two objects, one in each hand that you're gripping onto. You can do it with me to get the full experiential effect. Okay. When you are holding on to something like this, how well can you pick up anything else? <laughs> Try it. Try and pick up, you know, pick up something off the floor. The only way to pick something up is to open up, to let go. So when we hold too tight to things, it prevents us from the openness that's needed to be able to make a change in our life. Maybe it's to shift something in our relationship. Maybe it's something in our own health behavior. That's me on the airplane saying, ouch, my back hurts, but nope, I have to sit in my chair because that's what you have to do in an airplane. Once I let go of that belief, I could turn around and I'm not bothering anyone, sit on the floor and type on the floor. and My back doesn't hurt. So what is it that you are holding on too tight to? And we hold on too tight to all sorts of things, right? So we get attached to, we cling to. We cling to uh, feeling good all the time. So any kind of discomfort, whether it's emotional discomfort or physical discomfort, we, you know, we, 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 we don't want that. What we want instead is the feel goods. We hold on to expectations, hopes, and dreams. And, you know, hoping and dreaming isn't, isn't a problem, but it can be a problem for people. Because what if that hope or dream gets so rigid, they don't look for other options or they're not in the here and now because they're holding too tightly to an expectation of how it should be. We hold on too tightly to controlling others, to pleasing others, to chasing after material things, our rules, our routines that we don't even know that we have, but we, but we do. And one of the most dangerous ones is holding on too tight to being right and to our beliefs. I mentioned that there's some um, psychological science around this and what they're starting to find, we've, we've heard a lot about dopamine and the dopamine hypothesis in terms of craving, but what they're actually starting to find that is that there's a difference between wanting and liking in the brain. So wanting is what we often associate with craving and wanting the wanting neural mechanism has to do with dopamine and over time that um, that that system becomes hypersensitive right so the the wanting aspects of i want a donut or i want praise i want people to like me um, i want more things actually over time increases but the other part of that experience, the liking, which is the feeling of contentment when you receive that thing, actually decreases due to the development of tolerance. And so the sensitization theory of addiction is that you end up wanting it, but then not liking it. And you see this with substance use, you know, people that um, will, you know, will say, yeah, yeah like I, I use heroin or I use alcohol, I really crave it, I want it, but it just actually doesn't feel good to me anymore but we have that in ourselves as well where we want to go after something or we we want somebody to like us but actually when we get that praise it actually doesn't feel good anymore and so that's something that keeps us chasing keeps us working hard at things but not really feeling like we're getting anywhere so this type of attachment is seen in um uh, you can see it in all over the place, but I'm going to pause this because I want to describe what's happening in this study first. So they, they, I, many of you, I don't know if you've seen the study, but it was a study done um, quite a while ago um, with capuchin monkeys. And what they did is they put capuchin monkeys into two cages right next to each other. And the first monkey, if they put the, if the monkey put the rock in the hole, the researcher would give the monkey a cucumber. But the rock in the hole gets a cucumber. And then they brought in another monkey that was friends with this monkey. They had lived together. And this other monkey, the first monkey was looking at the other one, watched, 
while the researcher, when, when that monkey put the rock in the hole, it got a grape. Okay. And so this first monkey who was getting cucumbers goes over here and watches the monkey that gets a grape. And when he sees that monkey getting a grape, next time he gets a cucumber, you'll see what he does. See what happens. So as he gives a rock to us, that's the task. And we're getting grape and you will see what happens. So as he gives a rock to us, that's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now. Gets again cucumber. a rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. Okay. Anyone feel like that? <laughs> uh, oops. So, uh, the wanting versus liking. So we'll, we'll do this stuck in the story a second. But, but that experience of we get the thing, you know, we get it, we have cucumbers, but all of a sudden we see that somebody else is getting a grape and uh, it makes us not want our cucumbers anymore. Our cucumbers aren't, aren't good enough. Now we want grapes. Now, if they brought in like chocolate cake, right, then the grape we'd throw out and we'd want the chocolate cake. And then if it was chocolate cake with frosting, then we'd throw out and on and on and on and on. So we chase after things because of this nature, this human nature, to want, to cling, to crave. So the third reason why we end up being stuck, um, of working really hard and not maybe getting the satisfaction that we're hoping for, we're spinning our wheels, is that we're stuck in a story. And in Buddhism, they call this delusion, right? And we know from psychology that our, our minds were evolved, to, we evolved to tell stories. Stories are not necessarily bad. We need them to plan, we need to solve abstract problems, we need to create relations between things, uh, to imagine futures, to build a bridge. Some of these you know, projects that have taken many, many generations over time, we need to be able to see it and, and, sh and explain it and communicate about it and we need to communicate with each other. But our mind is a storytelling mind. And because our mind is a storytelling mind, it can also get us into all sorts of problems, right? Because we are not in the here and now, we're in a story about it. And some of the common stories that I, I, I you know, as a, as a psychologist, I'm always listening for, our, is someone caught in a story? Is it the story that's getting in the way of them being able to use their energy wisely? Because some of the stories that drive us are stories like, I'm not good enough. And when you have a story of I'm not good enough, then you'll keep on at it until you feel like, okay, that was, that was good enough, but then it's not good enough again. And so you're not really putting your energy in the places that matter to you. You're putting your energies in, into trying to prove this story. I'll be happy when we've all seen that. I mean, as a, somebody that went through years and years of school, it was, oh, you know, I'm going to be so happy when I'm out of graduate school. I'm going to be so happy when I'm out of, uh, you know, this training program. I'm going to be so happy when I finally get my first job. We all have that. And then it doesn't really come because that goalpost keeps moving forward. We have stories about being better than or worse than others. We have stories that it's all up to us, the victim story, the helpless story. We have stories that there's just one way to do things. We have stories that other people, whenever, whenever I hear something they are, or I am, or they always never can't, I always never can't. These are all stories that can prevent us from using our energy wisely. And, you know, we all have them, right? So there's a danger in believing your story. You can think about the things that you aren't doing right now because of a fear of what you might think may happen in a year from now or 10 years from now. And then all the things that we're not doing right now, 
because of what happened 10 years ago. Maybe the people that were not calling or, um, you know, I, I think I fell down skiing when I was like eight. <laughs> and it was such a horrible experience. I, I never wanted to go out and ski again for years and years and years and years, right? We have one thing that happens to us and then we tell, we build the story and it becomes our, our truth. And I see that a lot in my practice of stories that people have about what they're capable of or what they're not capable of, what they deserve or what they don't deserve, that ends up, ends up preventing them from living a really full and rich life or in putting energy in places that they want to be putting energy in. And if you, you know, go back to that, that screen, right, when, when we see a group of people, we have stories about people. We have stories about, oh, this person would be a nice person to have a cup of tea with, or this person, oh, they're a safe person. I could let them watch my computer at a coffee shop, or, oh, I'm glad I'm sitting next to this person and not that person on the plane. What if we crash? Or, oh, no, I'm sitting next to this person. Because we create, our mind creates stories, even just from people's characteristics, their looks, what they're wearing, how they um, uh, present themselves in just a few moments, and we don't really know who they are. This is the danger of the storytelling mind. So the fourth reason why we end up putting our energy in places that aren't helpful to us, we, we spend a lot of, expend a lot of energy on things and don't feel satisfied, is that we are running from discomfort. And this follows the um, sort of avoidance um, that in, we talk about delusion, attachment, and avoidance or aversion in Buddhism as sort of the three poisons. The aversion aspect also shows up in psychology where a lot of our um, psychological problems come from avoidance. So we can all think, you know, try and not think about our big toe and do our best to try and not think about our big toe. Whatever you do, don't feel or sense your big toe right now. Try and make that feeling go away. Put all of your energy into not feeling that or thinking it. Is anyone successful with that? Most, most people aren't. And the, the very nature of trying to not want something or trying to avoid it or make it go away makes it come back stronger. So there's been a lot of psychological studies that have looked at this where people try and not think about something or not feel something, it makes that something worse. Uh, it's the paradox of suppression. And many of our psychological problems, things like obsessive compulsive disorder, right? I, I don't want to think about my hands being dirty. I just, I can't, oh, germs, I can't think about it. And oh, oh my gosh. And then I'm going to do some things, you know, with OCD. I'm going to like count, I'm going to count to 10 or wash my hands five times or not walk on cracks. If I don't walk on a crack, then, then my, or if I make sure I count to seven every time before I walk in a room, then nothing bad will happen, right? So we create and con concoct all of these ways of trying to avoid something bad happening, but it makes it so much worse. Same thing with depression. You know, we, we feel terrible, so we climb into bed and we cover up our heads and hide away, which makes our depression even worse. So many of our psychological struggles come from running away from things, which is, um, you know, follows the, the Buddhist principles of aversion. And the ways in which we run away, we all do them because it's just human nature to run away. We run away by distracting ourselves, whether it's, um, you know, with our phones or just mental distraction. Uh, and I see that a lot in my practice when somebody's talking about something difficult, they may look away or they may kind of rush past it or speak really quickly or they smile while they're talking about how horrible something is. These ways in which we're trying to not feel. We numb ourselves with substances or um, numb ourselves with food or numb ourselves with, you know, all sorts of things to not feel. We, we go into our heads instead of our bodies. We stay busy. We try and prove our point. We brace. We tense up with our bodies. And all of us do these things. They're not inherently bad to do. But when we run away and it's running away from the things that we care about as well, it becomes problematic. Because if you're numbing out when 
you're with somebody that you love or you're intellectualizing when somebody that you care about is trying to tell, me, tell you about something that they're struggling with, it can become problematic. So avoidance or running away has a lot of costs. We miss out on the joy that's here. We, we turn away from our values. We use up a lot of our energy. There's a lot of secondary problems that can come with all of this as well. So if you have an addiction, there's um, secondary problems that come with avoidance. And we can think about, you know, if, if, if I weren't avoiding, if, if fear weren't such a problem for me, what would you do? If rejection and failure weren't such a problem for me, what would you do? If discomfort weren't such a problem for you, if judgment weren't such a problem for you, you could fill in all of these sentences and sometimes I'll have people, maybe you could pick one if you wanted to pick one and put it in the chat. Because this is when you actually start to see the possibilities that are available to you. And if you put your energy into the what would you do instead of the energy into the fear, the rejection, or the discomfort, then you can actually get going somewhere, right? Because we spend a lot of energy when we are avoiding things, just like we spend a lot of energy in our stories, and we spend a lot of energy trying to make ourselves normal, and we spend a lot of energy holding on too tight. So these are some of the things that keep us from the what would you do, from the life that you really want, from the connections that you want. Which leads us to the last one, that um, last reason why we may be using a lot of, of energy up, we may be putting a lot of effort out there and not getting where we wanna go. And this last one has to do with being headed in the right direction, being headed in the right direction. Sometimes I'll talk with my clients about the whole body yes and the whole body no. So how do you know if you're headed in the right direction? You can check in. Does this align with my values? Is this a whole body yes? Does it not align with my values that my body is saying no or my heart is saying no, but I'm doing it because I wanna be normal or because I'm stuck in a story or because I'm clinging to something or because I'm avoiding something. And some of the questions that I often will pose to my clients are things like, where and with whom do you wanna be more present in your life? So maybe we can answer some of these in the chat together. I'll post that one first and maybe you can write it in the chat. Where and with whom do you want to be more present? in your life. Go ahead and put it in. Where and with whom do you want to be more present? My family, with myself and my body, my husband. Where and with whom? With my adult children and my grandchildren, myself, my family and spouse my nieces and nephew. Spiritual friends. With other self-aware people. Nice. What brings you vitality? What brings you vitality? And by vitality, I mean, like when you're doing it, you feel energized. You feel alive. You feel... Um, that your effort is effortless. Friends, laughing, creativity, quilting, play. Being in nature, dogs, meditation. Beautiful. Sending meta, joy, jam session, exercise. Great. What matters most to you? What matters most to you? Let me put that in the chat. That's a big question. What matters most to you? Kindness, love, learning, the environment, connection, family, freedom, 
your family love, learning, hope, peace, peace, awareness, listening. And how do you want to show up in this moment? How do you want to show up in this moment? Hmm. Being present, open, kind, as I am. Nice, quiet, still, connected, awake, attentive, free, curious, balanced and calm, content, kind, genuine, beautiful. So these answers to this question, this question is, if we're not doing all the other stuff, so if we're not spending our energy on trying to be normal, okay, we spend a lot of time trying to be normal. If we don't spend our energy in a story, if we don't spend our energy holding on to things, clinging to things, if we don't spend our energy avoiding things, where are we going to spend our energy? We're going to spend our energy on these things, being authentic and harmonious and humble and trusting ourselves and loving and authentic and kind and balanced and curious and free and quiet and still and as you are and open. And where are you going to put that version of yourself? You're going to put it towards your family, towards justice, towards empathy, towards connection with others, towards your spiritual growth. You're going to put it towards your wife, towards your freedom, towards Marty Feldman, <laughs> uh, towards all sorts of things. And that is what I think is one of the most beautiful things that we can do because this was a picture that I took on the airplane of right the seat in front of me when we were waiting there for two hours. <laughs> And it just was someone reaching across the aisle, holding someone else's hand, as simple as that. That's a good use of that two hours, you know? We use up a lot of energy on trying to be normal. We use up a lot of energy up here in our heads, spinning around. We use up a lot of energy avoiding and clinging. And when we start putting our energy towards a direction that matters to us, that brings us vitality, it spreads. It spreads. So I'm going to stop sharing my slides. And I'm going to come back to the group. And I'd like to just open up a discussion because I kind of presented a lot of kind of unusual, odd information <laughs> in that slideshow. I don't know if it started out a little odd. But I'm curious, questions and thoughts and reflections. I thought we could have a little bit of a conversation in our last little bit of time here of what struck you, what stood out to you. And um, yeah, I'd love to hear from all of you so we can have a little conversation. We have one over here. Oh, yeah, a lot of them. Yeah. Um, Vera. Yes. Hi. Um, it was a great, great talk and speech. Thank you so much for the wonderful teacher you are. Um, I feel stuck with myself and dealing with my husband's disease yeah he has parkinson disease which is uh getting worse and worse and i notice and i usually the pain in my body warn me about where i'm at and <laughs> where i should be uh, so as i noticed uh, today with all the pain in my body i noticed that i'm too much worried about the, his uh, health and uh, I don't know how I can help him to get uh, better or, you know, deal with this situation. And at the same time, I feel too much responsible for his well-being. Yeah. And I think my attachment for his well-being caused the um, health in my body. But at the same time, I don't know how to let it go. Mm. Well, so that's I love to incredible hear insight. Yeah, wisdom. yeah. So next, you got to come back next week, Farah, because we're going we're gonna to talk about each and every one of those and what we can do instead. But uh, I yeah. first just want to say, you already are practicing awareness that you are noticing that your worry is, um, we, you know, we worry because we love people. You don't worry about things you don't care about. 
I really, I really, there's a lot I don't worry about. I'm, I, my family's really, my, my kids are really worried about the World Series. I am not worried about the World Series. <laughs> I don't care about it, <laughs> you know? So we worry about the things that we care about. And so one thing that I love to do when I'm worried is I, is I tell myself, oh, I'm worried because I care. I'm worried because I love this human. And then I say, okay, if I'm worried because I care, then how can I act from care, from love? And acting from love is different than being responsible for somebody's health. All of these words that were on the side of the chat, I just want to like take them home with me because they're such beautiful expressions of, and if you kind of like threw a dart anywhere at that page, it would give you some suggestions for how you could show up with your Perfect. husband. Because when we are suffering and we're, um, we're in pain, it, my experience is that what we, what we don't want is for people to worry about us. We want for people to be with us. Mm -hmm. And um, we don't, we, we actually don't want people to feel responsible for our suffering. We want people to be able to have the courage and capacity to be with our suffering. And that comes from you um, also being with your own suffering. You know, that caring, caring for your own, like how hard this is for you too. But we'll talk more next week about thank you so um, much. more Can't tools. Yeah. But thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Beautiful talk today. Uh, Elaine is up next. I'm going to ask her to unmute. Thank you so much. That was such a, a beautiful talk. And I don't, um, I haven't formulated any questions, but I had um, a couple of thoughts that I wanted to share. And one was an image of, um, you know, if you're light on your feet, you're able to act appropriately, right? You're not tied to your story uh, because like the story is the past, right? It's not the present or the future. So if you take your story, you're kind of not reacting or you're not acting right now, right? It's you, you're dragging your story with you. So I have this image of, you know, being able to be light on your feet and move this way or move that way. Even if it was totally different and you've never done it before it just that's what's calling out at the moment and and without that story you're free enough to do that but without without a judgment um the other thing that came to mind and i'm not exactly sure why but but rick once um in in one of his teachings and it's almost a con because I can't totally explain it. it. Said, "Teach me to care and not to care." Yeah. And that came to mind in this talk also because, you know, I, I'm hearing you. Sh you you need to react with presence and kindness and compassion, but not not get attached and not care that much that you're immobilized or. Um, will fall apart or can't move because you care that much and, mm -hmm. and you don't want to make a mistake. So that's that's kind of what came up for me. So so thank you. Yeah, I think that's a, a lesson that I've learned a lot as a as a therapist that it's actually a gift to people when you are not in that overly attached cling, clinging space with their suffering. Like th that it, it's a burden to them if you if you feel burdened by them right yeah, they, then they have to take care of you <laughs> then they have to take care of you yeah so yeah. it's it's like it's it's good you know like i'll be in a session with a client and i will be moved to tears and i will tear up with them and and they will see that i'm crying and we'll we'll be teared up together but i won't be moved to the point where i'm sobbing and I, you know and they have to come over and take care of me right so there's a there's that it's like a giving people also the the freedom to to take to to entrust that they that they can they can heal and it's a context that you're creating for that so yeah another hand let's see okay um, I think Peter is next Peter um, yeah uh, I rebelled viscerally <laughs> to what you were saying oh good <laughs> um, intellectually I took it all in and, and it makes complete sense to me and I've 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 done Buddhist and similar practice for decades. Viscerally, there is a part of me that just does not want to be here, does not mm -hmm. want to be present. 
and it's um, symbolic in that I have a, um, a sleep disorder, severe chronic sleep disorder for decades, where uh, uh, it it takes incredible effort to just do something very simple. The, the sleepiness, fatigue, um, and so I guess my question is. Do you know of any techniques? It's it's to get, uh, uh, once I asked a question of Rick, and he said getting this, there, a lot of people have a hard time getting from zero to one, meaning uh, doing any practice at all whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then he said, it's a mystery to me. Um, and for me, it's not a mystery. It's the whole ball of wax is getting from zero to one. And I don't necessarily mean making a, a daily commitment, but it's making that, just that effort in the moment to be present. Yeah. With, it, it, it's sort of an overwhelming, like, tide, you know, you talk about cravings, there are all these micro cravings. Yeah. A big tide that ends up being, you know, anyway, it could be craving, craving, could be just this huge fog of micro cravings. Yeah. And, so, Peter, yeah. can I ask you a question? Yeah. Do you feel present with me right now, with this group in this moment? Uh, no, <laughs> I was busy telling my story. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah right. So, 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 mm -hmm. step out of the story. Mm -hmm. And can you look at all the faces that are on this screen and all the different little worlds that they are in? So many worlds, mm. and be present with what you see. And then maybe choose one face and just be present with that face. And then hear my voice and be present with my voice. And then come back here. Were you able to do that? Yes. Okay. To, to a large degree. To a large degree. That's fine. Mm, yeah. That sounds like zero to one to me. So we start with what we can do and if you can do that for just you could do that practice in the in the grocery store you could do it you know wherever you're out and about if you go out and about walking on the street i do the just like me practice when i'm out and about to remember that just like me you know not not to tune people out because a lot of times we think of meditation as something that we need to do in a cushion with our eyes closed but i'm all about engagement engaged buddhism and that's what Thich Nhat Hanh taught it's what we do in the world that matters, not just on our cushions. So if, you, if you're having a, a, a trouble with zero to one, with craving or zero to one, that we start, like you said, the micro cravings. We can also the, notice the micro avoidance of not being present. And then you just, boom, four seconds of it. Training of the mind. It is a lot harder when you're sleep deprived. Sleep deprivation impacts all of our attentional capacities and being present is an attentional capacity. So it's, mm -hmm. you are, you are, you know, it's very difficult. So I, th I don't know if we have to stop there, Art. Uh, well, we usually stop at 7.30. That's right on the nose. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Should we allow yeah. one more question or do you? Um, just... Sure. Uh, Sarah's up next. I'll ask her to unmute. And Sarah, if you could turn on your camera too, that would be great. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for the talk. It was just really awesome and just something I needed to hear today. Um. I wanted to ask about discomfort because that's not like, that's confusing to me. I mean, I'll give an example. People take medications when they're in therapy to, to minim, I don't know, like minimize the discomfort of like, you know, um, difficult feelings. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is like, <laughs> I understand that we have to experience discomfort in life, but when is enough is enough kind of. Yeah. Um, well, I think you're answering a bit of your question, but <laughs> in asking that, that there's a, there's, um, there's compassion, right. That comes in. We want to increase our capacity to be with discomfort because even if you are, even if you have a mental health concern and you're on medication, even that doesn't get rid of it all. It doesn't. You know, it's, it's, there is no magic. I mean, you would have to take some 
serious, heavy tranquilizers to get rid of all of it, right? So there still will be some there. Sometimes the most compassionate thing to do is to take a medic, obviously to take a medication. Sometimes the most compassionate thing is to take a medication and also practice being with discomfort. Um, and some discomforts we can't get, we just, there, there is, we wouldn't want to get rid of, right? Grief. Grief is something that is so important for us to feel and to learn how to be with because there's so much beauty in grief. It says that we care about somebody and we cared about somebody. And I wouldn't say that, you know, if you're, if you're a week out grieving, we should give you a medication, right? But maybe you would need something to help you be able to get out of bed and function in the world and that would be fine. But questioning um, sort of the automatic getting rid of discomfort and seeing if we can increase our capacity to be with it. And that um, it's a very personal decision on where that point is, is sort of enough is enough. Yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. I lost you where you went in our, our little screen, <laughs> but you're somewhere in the mix. There, she is. Yeah. there you are. Thank you so much for answering yeah. my question. I appreciate yeah. it. It's good to yeah. see you and we look forward to seeing you next week. Yeah, thank you.